Amen. Well, we have this Sunday and then next week in Galatians, and then we're done, and we're hopping into 1 Samuel. And I need to give you a little bit of warning. About half the time together is going to be spent reading the scripture, because we are going to read it word for word, which means sometimes two chapters at a time. And you go, that's a lot of reading. I'll just say as a pastor, it's the word of God, so you have no argument against it. So it's actually a good thing. We're going to take it word for word. It might be a long read, but it's the word of God. And because it's the word of God, it's a good word. And we want to sit and bask in it. Um, So today and next week, finishing up Galatians, uh, it's been a it's been a really good book. It's been a convicting book for me. It's been a book of helping me to focus, and and hopefully it's the same for you to focus my heart to help me to realize who I am in Christ. Maybe those areas in my life that uh, man I'm I'm messing up in that I am relying upon my works uh, to be a child of God rather than relying upon God to be a child make me a child of God and. And up to this point, Paul has been speaking of justification. He's been speaking of sanctification. He's been speaking of what it means to be a child of God to these Galatian Gentiles um, who are being told and being taught that you need to do works in order to be saved. Do works to be justified and made right in the eyes of God. And so now in these verses, Paul He's been dictating this letter, and he finally picks up the pen himself, and he writes with his own hand, and it gives a very personal touch to the words that have so far been written. This is my letter to you. This is truly for me, he's saying. You could tell by the way that I'm writing. You know me intimately. These are my words that I'm speaking to you. And so far, Paul has corrected the false and deceitful teachings that the Galatian believers were, were hearing and believing for their justification, being made right in the eyes of God, and their sanctification, that lifelong process of being made more and more into the image of God and his character and obeying the commands and desires of God. And one is only made, Paul says, righteous before God, by grace, through faith, not by any works of our own, lest we have any grounds to boast in ourselves. And any good works of obedience are not accomplished on our power and our ability, but by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, who abides and lives in us after we are justified. No Holy Spirit in us, then our good works are just fleshly works. They're not godly works. No matter how good we view them, They are not done through the power of God in us. It's the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who makes his fruit grow in us. I could try to be as kind as I can, but even then that kindness, again, will be a worldly, fleshly kindness, not a Spirit-led kindness. It's the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us. It's the Holy Spirit who makes us more like Christ in our daily obedience to the Father. And Paul is just trying to drive this home to these believers. Remember who you are and who made you who you are. So here at the end of his letter, Paul speaks of two different kinds of boasting. Boasting in the flesh and boasting in the cross. Boasting means to glory or to brag in something or in someone. And And in the case of the Galatian churches, Paul points to them to assess where does your boasting lie? Where is your glory being given to? What what are you bragging about? What are you holding high? Because what we boast about, what we glory in, what we hold high, what we brag about when it comes to the source of our spiritual state reveals who we actually are. We're either people of God or we're enemies of God. And that's harsh. That's hard to hear. You say, well, that's unloving and discouraging. It's the word of God. There is no fence to straddle. 
when it comes to being a child of God, you're either his child or you are his enemy. There are two groups, as he says, with people when it comes to boasting. There is no fence. There is no gray area. There's no neutral position that sees both sides as true. You're on one side or you're on the other. One side of the fence is boasting and glorying in the flesh. In verses 12 through 13, Paul is specifically speaking of the false teachers that had infiltrated the ranks of the churches who taught a gospel plus message. That faith in Christ for justification was good, but it's, it's not enough. You need to do more than that. One also has to be circumcised, has to follow the Jewish food laws and the festivals. And Paul characterizes these false teachers as desiring to make a good showing for themselves, desiring to avoid persecution, unable to keep the law themselves, and desiring to boast in the flesh of others. So here's your four points right there of the first part. (laughs) Those who boast in the flesh desire to make a good impression to others. These false teachers wanted to brag about how many of the Gentile believers they were actually getting circumcised. It would be similar to a pastor today touting how many baptisms they had last year. Hey, you don't believe pastors do that. Join a pastor's group and sit in and listen. Like, how many notches do you have on your belt from last week? You know, it's, and we all do it. We brag, whether you're a pastor or not. One should be wary of leaders and teachers in the church who brag about their own accomplishments, desiring the attention of others, and putting so much weight behind what others think of them. The second characteristic, those who boast in the flesh also desire to avoid persecution for the cross. In the first century, it was illegal not to worship the Roman gods. That's the way it was. Jews were the exception to this rule and were actually protected by the Roman government, mostly because if they didn't get their way, they caused a lot of problems. And the Romans said, "Uh, enough's enough. It's just easier to let you worship your one God. And then you don't cause any problems for us, which in the end didn't really work out for them either. But this little sect of Christians were not Jews. And so their worship was illegal, meaning persecution was inevitable by the Romans. So to avoid this persecution, these false teachers were in essence forcing these Gentile Christians to become circumcised. For if if one uh, was circumcised and followed the food laws of the Jewish religion, then one could claim protection as a Jew. He could tell the Jews, see, look, we're actually Jews. And to the Romans, see, look, we're actually Jews. And in doing this, the false teachers were protecting themselves from the Romans' utter revulsion toward the cross, which we're going to get to in a bit, and to appease the Jewish requirements of obedience to the law for justification before God. And one should be wary of leaders and teachers in the church who attempt to please others in order to avoid being persecuted for their faith. A great sign is someone who says, yeah, but be wary of those people. Which brings us to the third characteristic. These false teachers who require Gentile believers to keep the law were themselves unable to keep the law. Deuteronomy 27, 26. Cursed be anyone who does not conform to the words of this law by doing them. Or James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. One should be wary of leaders and teachers in the church who place requirements on others which they themselves are unwilling or unable to fulfill. And then the final characteristic, boasting in the flesh, is boasting in the flesh of others. Theologian Leon Leon Morris says this, instead of emphasizing the spiritual uprightness of life demanded by the law, the law says, do this. This is how you are to worship God. It's about spiritually 
your heart being focused on God. Instead of focusing on that, these false teachers focused on the number of Gentiles that they could persuade to be circumcised. It would be, again, like a pastor today, emphasizing how many people attended a weekly worship service while ignoring the true spiritual state of those individuals. It would be me saying, I don't really care where you are spiritually. I just want your butt in the seat so that it makes me look better. That's what these false teachers were doing. They were motivated by physical, not spiritual, by the flesh, not by the spirit. One should be wary of leaders and teachers in the church who are motivated by fleshly desires such as numbers and money instead of the spiritual state of those that they lead. Now, as a disclaimer, numbers and money are great tools to see where is the health of a church. But that is not the center. It's a tool. It helps us to understand where we are as a church, but it doesn't make us who we are as a church. But, one of the greatest words in Scripture, in contrast to those who boast in the flesh, Paul gives one overarching characteristic of those who do not boast in the flesh using himself as an example to imitate. They boast in the cross. And it's easy for us to miss how utterly crazy this statement actually is and would seem to the first century church. And we have crosses everywhere. People wear it on their necklaces. Okay, for us, if you want to bring it in today, it would be like wearing an electric chair on your necklace and saying, I love Jesus. Look at the electric chair. It it would be utter nonsense to us today. The cross, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.23, the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. It's a stumbling block to the Jews because according to the Mosaic law, and this is quoted for verbatim in Deuteronomy 21, and if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is, a, is cursed by God. These Christians are worshiping this Jesus who was cursed by God, and that's why it's a stumbling block for every Jew. You want me to praise a criminal who died the worst possible death ever? devised by man, who's cursed by God himself. Why would I worship this guy? For the Romans, the cross was seen as barbaric, shameful, and dishonorable. According to F.F. Bruce, even the word for crucifixion, the word crucifixion was unmentionable in polite Roman society. These Christians worshiped a God who died the most horrible and shameful death imaginable. And that is why it is a folly to the Romans. And yet Paul says, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For Paul and for every one of us who are Christians, the cross is the central stage of our justification before God. Christ himself took upon himself the curse curse of sin, which was rightly deserved for us. Death and shame. He took the the curse meant for me and on the cross, he justified me before the Father in heaven. Me! Christ took upon himself the shame of sin that you and I rightly deserve justifying us before a perfect and holy God. Without the cross, we would be lost. We would rightly be condemned for our sinful rebellion. As we looked at the last couple of weeks, we would reap the corruption of eternal death in hell, away from God's presence, away from God's grace, away from God's love. For the Christian. Then and today, the cross is not a stumbling block and it's not a folly. It's the means to a new life. We see the shame of the cross. 
we see the curse of the cross and we say, thank you, God. Because that's what I deserve. That's why we hold it so highly. Not because it's pretty. In fact, it's the ugliest thing we could ever imagine if we really think about it. But it's the most precious thing to us as Christians. These false teachers, these false teachers were focused on the flesh, the glory of good impressions, the glory of avoiding persecution. But Paul gloried in the cross of Christ for it was at the cross where he was made a new creation. Do you remember Paul's life? If we have any familiar, if we've read the book of Acts, we, we read about his life before that infamous trip to Damascus. He fought tooth and nail to destroy Christianity at any cost. Even watching it provenly as stolen, Stephen was stoned in front of him. He hated Christ. He hated the church. He was a good Jew, the best Jew of his day, he says. And yet for all of his obedience to the law, his spiritual state was one of the flesh. He was about the outward appearance, about protecting the Jewish tradition at any cost. But on the inside, his heart was one of stone. He lived for fleshly desires, even if they were religious fleshly desires. And it was only through encountering the risen Christ that he was changed, that he was made a new creation. His heart of stone was softened. His fervor to follow the law for his justification was obliterated in that moment. Where once he boasted in his flesh, he now boasted in the work of Christ upon the cross, as he calls himself for the chief of all sinners. But it's not just Paul who's made new, so are the, the great, uh, Galatians. And so are any of us who boast only in the cross. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For by the, with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You miss that? You're a Paul pre to Damascus. Galatians 3, 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Or Galatians 3, 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Those who boast in the flesh are not children of God. Those who boast in the flesh are not children of God. They're enemies of God. But those who boast in the cross, those who look to the cross, realize what it actually is, realize the importance of what Christ did on the cross, are children of God. He uses a weird phrase at the end, is the Israel of God. You would think like, usually you hear the God of Israel, right? Now he says, no. The Israel, those who follow this rule, he says, those who by faith look and boast in the cross, not in their flesh, those are the true Israel of God. God's chosen people, made of Jew and Gentile, man and woman, slave and free. Those things, and we could add so many more, Jew and Gentile, Man and woman. So you got your ethnicity, your race. You've got your gender. You've got your socioeconomic status. Your emotions. Let's just continue. Your, whatever, whatever is fleshly, whatever this world holds so highly, Paul says, those things that I held so dear and so true have been crucified on the cross. That means they're dead to me. They have no power. Over me, and we've we've looked at this in the past to say if they have any power in the flesh has any power in me, it's because I have welcomed it and I have wanted it, and I have given it that power. But the cross has defeated the flesh. The cross has defeated the flesh. 
The cross has defeated the desires of this world, the desires of this earth. And so when we hold things higher than the gospel, when we hold our race, when we hold our money, when we hold our possessions, when we hold our politics, when we hold our emotions, when we, whatever, when we hold that high above the gospel and we say, if you do not do this, then you are not a true Christian We are the false teachers. We're the false teachers in Galatia. And Paul says, don't be them. If you are a child of God, your flesh has been defeated. Hold high the gospel. Humble yourself before Christ. Your flesh has been crucified. And you are crucified to your flesh. And we boast in Jesus Christ. We boast in anything else. We have missed the target. Far be it from us as Christians to boast in anything that we have done, anything that we will do, except in the cross of Christ. For in the cross, the desires of the world, the desires of the flesh are killed and they are replaced with the desires of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. All the works of the flesh, we in our society hold so dear, Paul says, counts for nothing. We can get up to heaven in the day that he brings us home and we can say, but God... I did this. And God's going to go, what does that have to do with anything? That doesn't have to do with your justification. The question is, is, do you know my son? Do you have faith in my son? And if you don't, it doesn't matter how many good things you've done. You will not be in my presence. They count for nothing when it comes to our justification and our sanctification. But being made a new creation through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us counts for everything. Everything. Now, don't hear me. That's not an excuse to not do good works. Read James. It's all over in James. Read the rest of the New Testament. He even says here, do good things, but that's not what saves us. Good things are good, but when they take precedence over the gospel message of salvation and justification by grace through faith, when those become more important than the gospel, we're lost. When we are made a new creation through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, who gets the glory? Who gets the glory? God gets the glory. If we were honest with ourselves, we would be like Paul and say, why would God save the chief of sinners as such as I am? Why would he do that? He does it for his glory. He does it for his praise. God gets the honor, not us. And as a new creation by the cross of Christ, that's how we are made children of God. That's how we are called the Israel of God. No other way. No other way. My hope and my prayer for us as a church, man, we're we're not going to be perfect but my hope is that we're faithful, that we never stop raising the gospel high because the temptation in our world today is to put everything else first. The temptation in our own heart is to raise everything else first. And then what happens is we begin to understand the gospel by these first things rather than seeing those things through the eyes of the gospel. 
May that not happen to us. May we always be faithful to the gospel as a church. May we always be humble. May we always look at our hearts and realize, as we said over the last number of weeks, without the Christ, therefore goes I. I would be lost without Christ. And so I can't get the praise. I want to point people to Christ, not to themselves, not to self-help, not to whatever the politicians are saying, not to whatever, whatever the pastor is saying. I want to put people to the word of God for it is in the power of the word that lives are changed, the power of the cross. We are made a new creation and we are made into the children of God. May that be for us true every single day. And when we fail, we struggle, and through the power of God, we would stand up and we would remain faithful, no matter what. Father, I pray, I, I ask that as your people here at Elm Creek, Father, that we would take these words that we would God, that we would be humbled by them, that we would, we would look to you and remember who we are is in you, not in what the world says, not even what we think of ourselves. It is what your word says about us, and we are your children. But God, there are people around us, there may even be people in this room right now who are not saved, who have not looked to the cross, who have who have not been made a new creation to the power of your indwelling spirit. And I pray, God, that they would believe that you would soften their heart to see and understand the power of the cross, why it is so important. And if they would believe with their hearts that they would confess with their mouth that your son is the savior of this world. And they would believe and they would be saved and they would join your family, God. Help us, God, as your people to be faithful, to remember who we are is because of the cross. And as this world fights against us, that we would not be people who desire the accolades of the flesh, but instead fight tooth and nail against the flesh to bring you the glory. Father, the day that we as a church make us more important than you, may you kill us as a church and us as a church. We ask this, Father, that you would be glorified. You would be the center and that you would use us as your people as broken as we are but saved to do your work and to boast in you and have people see that we boast in you and in you alone. We ask this, Father, that you would do this in your name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we sing our final song?